Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deep. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntax in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDAP and ESCCP. This webinar will consist of a brief overview of both programs, followed by technical discussions on innovative modeling tools to analyze ecosystem services on Department of Defense lands and installations. We will start with Dr. Nate McDowell of Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, who will discuss his work on developing a framework for evaluating management alternatives for different ecosystem services and predicting their impacts on climate and the environment. Nate's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Then Dr. Mark Borsak of Duke University will provide an overview of his research on applying a computational assessment tool to document the value that military bases provide to local communities in the form of ecosystem services. Mark's presentation will also be followed by a brief Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, uh, download Zoom at the link shown here. Uh, this link was also provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you are unable to download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge and by creating a free Zoom account. Uh, if you are unable to view the slides or if your screen freezes, try keying Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh of your screen. If you are trying to access audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have technical difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. You may also submit a comment using the chat box. Please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for our two speakers. Finally, in case of continued technical difficulties, just download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Keep in mind that we will be live streaming the webinar on the CERDAP and ESCCP YouTube channel, and the link is shown here. A reminder about the Q&A session. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A sessions to submit your questions. We do encourage you to submit them well in advance of the Q&A sessions. And when you do submit them, make sure to add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify your organization during the Q&A sessions. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Kurt Preston, who is the Startup and ESCCP Program Manager for the Research Conservation and Resiliency Program area. Dr. Preston has tracked his career between civilian university and military positions. Prior to his current position with CERDAP and ESCCP, he was a faculty member and research administrator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he led faculty development efforts to improve research competitiveness. In this position, he also worked with technology transfer personnel, academic departments, and colleges to build university research capability. In addition, Dr. Preston has served as a member of Chief of the Army Corps of Engineers Environmental Advisory Board. Kurt, uh, please proceed. Thank, thank you, Rula. I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. So CERDIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program established by Congress 
1991 as a partnership between the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. CERDOP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on Department of Defense requirements. CERDOP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERDIP or on other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance of technology. CERDIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERDIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supported by lab efforts. There are four program areas in CERDIP and five in ESTCP. The installation energy and water program area is only found at ESTCP, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and resiliency, and weapon systems and platforms are found both in CERDIP and ESTCP programs and are managed jointly by a single designated program manager. Our webinar today is focusing on research and development that were conducted under the Resource Conservation and Resiliency Program area, which essentially has three main areas of research, natural resources, resiliency, and wildland fire. Our webinar series <clears throat> highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. As you can see, upcoming webinars will cover a broad range of topics, including waste reduction and treatment in armed forces vessel environments, software and hardware solutions for securing DOD control systems and infrastructure from cyber threats, and predicting PFAS fate and transport in the subsurface environment. The next resource conservation webinar will be offered on August 20th and will address threatened and endangered species on DOD lands. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded from our webinar webpage. We would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. I hope you uh, really enjoy today's webinar. Thank you, Kurt. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first technical speaker, Dr. Nate McDowell, who is an earth scientist in the Watershed and Ecosystem Science Division at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Dr. McDowell's training is in, uh, is in understanding the carbon water balance of trees at leaf to ecosystem scales. After performing post, uh, uh, postdoctoral work um, at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, Nate worked there for 15 additional years before moving to PNNL. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the University of Michigan, his Master of Science degree in tree physiology from the University of Idaho, and his doctoral degree in forest ecosystems from Oregon State University. Nate, we're very happy to have you. Please proceed. Thank you much for the introduction, Lula, and thank you for the invitation to present Dr. Preston, and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, 
Indeed, I was trained as a forester, and I'm going to bring that perspective to this presentation. However, I was only really a co-PI functionally on this project. I want to acknowledge that Dr. Rajiv Prasad, also of Pacific Northwest National Lab, was my co-lead, and he represented the economic functions aspect of this project. I will do my best to represent both together. And functionally, I have to also acknowledge that this project was the result of a lot of efforts from our colleagues, Zelly Tan, Dave Anderson at PNNL, as well as Matt Herto at University of New Mexico. So the, the outline I'd like to follow for today is briefly introduce ecosystem services. Probably most of us know what we mean by that, but it's good to be on the same page. Then I would like to introduce the final ecosystems goods and services classification system. It's an EPA system originally developed to allow us to value ecosystem services in, in ways that enable us to compare apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. Um, then I'll focus on how we model ecosystem services and how we then integrate those model results into FEGSCS. And I'd like to close by identifying some next steps, some, some challenges that we need to overcome. So ecosystem services are things that are valued by DOD and valued by the public. So for example, training areas and transport routes, threatened and endangered species, harvest products and land for buildings are all things that, that matter to, to maintaining a functional system on our bases. But some of these things are also valued outside of our bases and therefore we need to be able to have our base management needs to be able to, to view a holistic picture of how they manage their ecosystems, of course. The ones that are valued by the public, again, include threatened and endangered species habitat, but they can also involve things like recreation or environmental values. And so what we want to do is integrate then the final ecosystem goods and services classification system with ecosystem models to allow us to make predictions about how management may be employed to maximize benefits to the DOD management. So ecosystem services, again, consist of a variety of things, some of which are hot topics, right? You know, we have spotted owls in the northwest and the red cockatated woodpecker in the southeast that are threatening endangered species on our bases that need to be protected by law. But at these same bases, we need to maximize things like carbon sequestration to minimize carbon efflux to the atmosphere. Sometimes we want to have harvested products that are of value, especially in the Northwest, for example. So it's balancing all of these that was really the objective of our project and finding out how management can, can be best used to, to do this. So process models have a role to play. On this figure, you should be able to see the habitat area of squirrels on the left-hand side versus above-ground biomass, how much, how much forest biomass there is standing on the x-axis. And you can see in this analysis that different, this is all model results now, this is not real data, this is model results, I remind you. But you can see that the control plots have less habitat area for squirrels, even though they have lots of biomass, than plots that have been managed, such as by thinning or prescribed burning. And this is for the Southeast, this is for, uh, for the Southeast, but it could, this kind of application is appropriate for most of the DOD bases as we found in our study. Let me step into the thin ice part of the talk for myself, because this is not where I'm an expert, but what I've learned a lot through the last couple of years of working with Dr. Prasad is that we can use a conceptual framework that has the model component buried into it to enable us to make predictions of value to both DOD and the public. So what you see here in the blue box labeled A are the ecological processes, the ecology and the natural environment, ecosystem services that we may care about. And in the yellow box, you see the beneficiaries, 
both the DOD and the public, which have multiple benefits that result in values. And we can integrate the model then into this process. I'm showing you a more complex version of the slide now, where we can simulate the different processes that would be shown under ecosystem services in the middle, upper middle of your figure and link them to FEGS CS through a classification, which is the arrow going to the right, and eventually impact, provide values of impact and value to the DOD and the public. So this is the concept, but it's not that simple. FEGS CS was really built by the EPA for non-DOD type applications. Not to say that it wasn't a great tool for us to, to adapt, but it did require some adaptation. And this, in, you know, these, some of these challenges we, we're, we're faced with that come through this, such as we're limited to terrestrial classes. So some bases may have a significant aquatic environment on their base. We did not address that in this project. That is something that has to be done in the future as an example. So just as an example of the terrestrial classes that DOD foresters tend to use, you, we can see this table here. And ten, in the top, in the blue at the top, you can see forests, grasslands, and shrublands. Those are examples of the different kinds of ecosystems that we can simulate and then evaluate. There's things like timber extraction, property owners, et cetera, that matter in, this, in these classes. But I would highlight that ultimately, one of the things that came about through all of our conversations with DOD land managers was that training land was critical. And this includes mounted and unmounted type training, and it, which requires different types of ecosystems. In some ecosystems, we require relatively open area to enable movement of troops and some sometimes the troops require much more closed areas for their training and so these were things that we tried to simulate through our model analysis now back to the modeling component of this we used existing simulations from the landis 2 model which is a very nice demographic model a carbon cycle model that takes in climatic variables and soils and edaphic type property variables and enables us to simulate what will be the future of forest growth, for example, on that, in that area. It's very adaptable in the sense that this model can be used to simulate management implications. So if we thin the forest to reduce biomass and promote more old growth structure, for example, which is good for threatened and endangered species typically, we can predict then how sustainable will that management application be. Same for prescribed burning. And the reason why we need to do this in part, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that forest fires are a large, and bark beetle outbreaks are a large issue throughout many of our bases in the US. And because of that, management such as reducing biomass through thinning or prescribed burning is often considered the most sustainable option to keep forests on your land to avoid a complete catastrophic wildfire, for example. So there's all these different motivators and values that, that, met, that the DOD land managers need to balance, which is really challenging. And hopefully we've provided something of useful for so here are a few example results. This is carbon exchange, which was not one of the biggest priorities by the land managers, but it does come and go in terms of its priority for DOD basis. So on the left-hand side, NEE refers to net ecosystem CO2 exchange. A negative value means the ecosystem, the forest, is sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So you can see here that control stands on the left-hand side panel suck less CO2 out of the atmosphere than managed stands, okay? This is for Joint Base Lewis-McChord up in the Northwest. So this suggests that long-term through management, you can actually sequester more carbon. The panel B is the same exact data, but the red line is simply the control line and everything is normalized relative to that. So you can see the difference or the delta. 
Now, the figures on the left are the lowest panel, panel C on the left. I've already shown you that was the previous panel B. This is the delta net ecosystem exchange, how much carbon is sucked up by thinned or burned stands relative to the controls. Except for this is now at three sites, the upper panel being Fort Benning, the middle panel being Camp Navajo, and the bottom one being JBLM. And you can see there are regional differences in the effect of management on carbon storage. Now let's look on the figures on the right-hand side, which are threatened and endangered species habitat. Again, this is the difference relative to a control stand. A control stand is a stand that has no management. And you can see in general at all of the sites, maybe weekly at JBLM, but more strongly at Fort Benning and Camp Navajo, that threatened and endangered species habitat generally appears to increase, at least over the long term, through active management at those sites. Now again, active management means not necessarily cutting down the big trees for harvesting, it's cutting down the small trees to maximize old growth structure for these particular species. So there do, does seem to be positive applications of management for certain for these different values. However, warming does tend to overwhelm these. In this figure, what we've done is compared baseline simulations to simulations assuming a business as usual fossil fuel emission scenario. Okay, assuming no change in our global trends of CO2 input to the atmosphere which does cause warming of the atmosphere. And this warming, when now analyzed in the model, of course, suggests that carbon exchange will be less uptake due to warming, meaning the forest will grow more slowly. Simultaneously, threatened and endangered species habitat tends to go down with warming. And this is largely because of loss of forest due to mortality. Now, ultimately, we wanted to bring these simulations back to the integration effort with FEGS and estimate values of, uh, estimate the values of ecosystem services that are valued to the public and to the DOD. Now, there's a lot of assumptions that went into this, such as habitat area we looked at in forests. We didn't look at much in the for habitat area for threatened and endangered species, such as in aquatic environments, as I mentioned earlier. We made assumptions about where training lands would be used, which forests versus grasslands versus shrublands and how they're used for mounted versus dismounted training. This was relatively well informed, but it could be better informed, we feel. And the effect of training on habitat loss, a, a backwards feedback, if there's any of negative effects of training on the actual habitat, that's not incorporated at all. So what we found when we integrated these analysis, and I, know, I realize the, why I, the legends are a bit small, but we showed that habitat area in the upper left increased at, this is at JBLM, by the way, I should have labeled that. Under the different scenarios, habitat area increased and warming is not that negative an impact, it turns out in the Northwest, because it's such a wet place. Dismounted training area, for example, shows quite a bit of variability the, the big jag, jaggy uh, shape in the line that you see, that's different. Those are different entries for doing management. So you see when they thinned and when, they, when it regrew. And then you can see mounted training area generally decreased. And this is because we assumed mounted training area tended to be less forested areas. And at JBLM, the predictions are of an increase in forest area. Now, how accurate are all these results? Certainly, we evaluated, especially through the work of, of Matt Hurto at University of New Mexico, we evaluated all these model results against current data sets. However, their accuracy when you run them into the future is always something that has to be questioned and looked at. However, given those assumptions, it does seem that JBLM, that land management alternatives don't make a huge effect on training land. And that's good news for JBLM. This isn't the case at necessarily all sites. At some sites under the RCP 8.5 scenario, which is the fossil fuel emission scenario, it's business as usual, we see a, a large decrease in, in, in training areas potentially 
So it's, this is exciting, but it's preliminary. You know, this is just for one site. We did do the model analyses at three different sites, but we did the FEGS CS integration just at one site. And we need to move beyond that eventually to really see how generalizable this is. I'm going to conclude with my last couple of slides by identifying the big challenges that we, we see in front of us. The, again, as I mentioned, we don't have anything besides terrestrial classes. We haven't looked at atmospheric impacts, for example, of wildfire, for example. We have not, although that's possible through model coupling, we haven't looked at the aquatic environments. We need to look at the feedback and effects of training on habitat areas. And, and furthermore, our analyses were only done at the annual scale. And there are some important distinctions about seasonality, especially when it comes to threatened and endangered species. Regarding valuation, we need to improve our understanding of DOE, DOD values of training lands, because it's not just the annual number of when they can go into the land, but there's a seasonal value, there's et cetera, these challenges that we need better integration through communication. We need site-specific public non-use values. We need to connect the habitat areas to the threatened and endangered species better. So there's a few challenges that we're still facing. However, we feel like we're optimistic that this may be a value once we can really rigorously evaluate it at multiple sites. The simulations we used were existing simulations because this was a pilot study. We would like to ultimately employ a more, potentially a more advanced model that involves more physiological realism that might allow us to get more precise estimates in the future of forest growth and subsequent habitat areas and training lands. And certainly more valuation on the ground valuation is needed. What I've shown you today was based on valuations that were done at multiple sites about five years ago, eight years ago through a previous CERTIP project. And uh, we need to advance those to make sure that we trust our results. So going forward, ultimately, we would like to keep developing this and to maximize our benefits, both socioeconomically and in terms of the valuation to, to the stakeholders. Uh, hopefully, the DoD benefits to this ultimately will be a more fair valuation of ecosystem services that's really of use to management on the land. And the ability not only to say, what should I do for next year, but what should I do in terms of management for the next 20 or 50 years? How can we manipulate these forests or protect these forests or grasslands as appropriate? so that we maximize training land, maximize the, the ecosystem service output that both the public and the DOD require. This should make a good decision-making tool. Ultimately, that should be the ultimate product here. And if it's useful, it should help with relationships with the uh, public and, and the government. So in conclusion, I'd like to say we, we, we are optimistic, but things can be improved. Species level stuff, for example, I haven't talked about. There could be errors due to different species that may matter for habitat, and we need to get those correct. The valuation framework appears very logical, but is relatively untested. We may be doing an in-depth study at Fort Benning that we proposed, and if possible, if we do that, we'll be able to get much more detailed and focused analysis on FEGS CS and its value for the training lands. And an improved representation of end user needs is critical, both for training lands and for other habitat requirements. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nate. We've received a number of questions. And as a reminder, for those of you on the line, you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, all right, first question, Nate. How will atmospheric changes such as warming temperatures or rising carbon dioxide likely to influence valuation estimates? They're very, it's a great question and it's a great interest of mine is that this, we're not living in a static environment. Things are chronically changing right now and we need to address that. So I love that question. 
Warming for sure. We see overwhelming evidence, not just from this project, but from everything I look at, that warming is usually bad for the productivity of forests and reduces forest productivity. There are exceptions to this. There are places, for example, in Alaska where growth has been shown to increase. So it's not a one size fits all answer. That said, warming is generally detrimental. Now, how does that affect the, hab the species that becomes uh, like threatened endangered species becomes a big question. Now, CO2 generally helps species grow, although it's been shown pretty clearly now that only about 20 to 30% of the Earth's ecosystems are showing a big CO2 or any CO2 fertilization effect with the remaining 70% or so of the ecosystems on the Earth generally constrained by other factors. So they're not able to capitalize on the CO2, such as they have low fertility, poor soils, et cetera, drought. So these things interact, what the net effect is of the good effects of CO2 and the negative effects of warming, that net impact is a big science question and is very difficult to test without models. And it may vary based on which part of the region of the US you're in. I hope I answered that question adequately. You sure did. Thank you so much. This is uh, a question from the statistical research. Uh, can you comment on what you learned when you applied your modeling at Camp Navajo in terms of changing the threatened and endangered uh, species habitat area and training area? We didn't look at training areas specifically at Camp Navajo. We only did the integration all the way up to training area with FEGSCS at JBLM. However, the Camp Navajo results, which are in review currently uh, in the literature in review being challenged, uh, those are, did, we did show that management was essential to protecting the forests at Camp Navajo because of the wildfire risk there is so extreme. So thinning and prescribed burning done wisely there resulted in a very sustainable forest growth despite some reductions due to warming of course, but the reductions were least in the situations where thinning and prescribed burning were, were employed. Thank you, Nate. Here's a question from Oregon State University. You highlighted the DOD and public as stakeholders in the understanding of ecosystem services. Um, how do you uh, account for the public? Do you have ways of describing evaluation process that requires a deeper uh, input uh, from the public? That would be one of the next steps we have to do. By the way, go Beavers. I'm a ex-Oregon State person myself. Um, yeah, that would require a better inv in investigation into public, into the public stakeholders than we have accomplished thus far. But what would need to be done, and Rod, Dr. Prasad is the expert on this. I'm just the uh, I'm, I'm the side guy on this part, but he would lead efforts to investigate and query the public on what their what their key values are and to pro, and to try through FEGSCS to put real numbers to what those values are so that they can be integrated with the DOD effort. Great, thank you Nate. This is a question from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, one major ecosystem service uh, relates to water quality and quantity. Was that ES part of your analysis and if not Will it be a part of your future research? No, it was not part of the current analysis. And yes, we think it's critical for future research. Of course, that comes down to, if we were funded, it comes down to what the DOD base managers really, and the public really value. And we'd have to do that assessment before we decided what are the key values we're going to investigate here, but we suspect that water quantity and water quality would emerge as very critical. They are feasibly modeled and they are feasibly integrated into FEGSCS. So there's no, nothing really stopping us from doing that. Great, thank you. Um, what happens to the carbon budget if you factor in the release during burning or composition of thin biomass? 
Absolutely. The carbon budget in the short term after a prescribed burn is negative. Well, I used negative earlier for a positive. So let me be clear. Shortly after you thin and or burn, the ecosystem releases more CO2 to the atmosphere than it absorbs. That is totally correct. However, that is a transient ephemeral response. And over with usually within a decade or so, depending on the ecosystem you're working in, the system has regained its positive carbon balance, meaning it's sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And it's usually at a higher rate than if it had been unmanaged. Now, if you add on to this the risk of wildfire, which completely reverses the carbon budget for longer time periods, then the net effect of thinning is that you really store more carbon on the landscape than if you didn't. This again is not a catch all for all systems, but for many systems, that's the case. Great, thank you so much. Um, here's another question for you. How were soils incorporated in your model? And what assumptions uh, did you make about soil response to these treatments? I think soils are an area where fire. I'm sorry, Rula, what was the end of your question? Uh, such as prescribed fire. Okay, yeah. As, as a typical response. Right. Well, I, th I think soils are an area where in general models can do better and most modelers would agree on this in terms of how they affect ecosystem function. And Landis is no exception to that. So I would say this is an area where improvement can be done. However, Landis does incorporate soil texture, soil depths, models that, that we would use in the future would do the same to enable improved hydraulics, plant water relations. And so that is an important step. But the validation of those below ground processes is really the hard part and really an important part. So I think it's a great question and, and, and it was addressed, but could it be done better? For sure. All right, and one last question before we move on to our second speaker. This is a question from the US Army Environmental Command. Did your ecosystem services research or integrated simulations account for training impacts on, on insulation areas that resulted in severe erosion of soil, morphological layers, or damage to native vegetation on habitats? Right, it's a great question. So in terms, so in general, the answer is no, we have not looked at feedbacks of training upon the ecosystem services. And we feel like that needs to be done. Specifically, it needs to be done with erosion, as you have mentioned, because erosion can be a significant issue, which subsequently feeds back on water quality, feeds back on native vegetation, et cetera. One of the people on our team, Dr. Tan, is an erosion specialist. Um, he likes, he models erosion. And so one thing we may bring in to the next layer of efforts if we go forward is to do ex explicit erosion modeling, for example. So we, and explicitly to uh, in, integrate the effects of training on the ecosystems. So I, it's a great point and, and we'd like to do, it, it's, it needs to be done. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Nate, for a really interesting presentation and a great Q&A session. At this point, we are going to transition to our second, uh, second speaker today, who is Dr. Mark Borsak. Mark is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Duke University. He is also co-director of the Duke Center on Risk. Previously, Mark was assistant professor of engineering at Dartmouth College. Uh, his research focuses on the development and application of mathematical models for integrating scientific information on natural, technical, and social systems. Mark has authored over 85 peer-reviewed journal uh, publications and six book chapters. He received a Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree in Civil Engineering and Operations from Princeton, a Master of Science degree in Statistics and Decision Sciences from Duke, and a postdoctoral, a postdoctoral uh, and a doctoral degree in aquatic and atmospheric sciences, also from Duke. Mark, please proceed. 
So the agenda for my talk today will be, I'll um, be discussing how military bases provide ecosystem services. Um, we've already heard from Nate on some of those, and I believe that that's, um, I'll, I'll be building on that. Um, I'll also talk about how base management activities can um, influence these services, what kinds of activities and to what degree they might influence in a positive or negative way the delivery of those ecosystem services. Um, we will be focusing on how we might translate those into monetary values. One of the key concepts of ecosystem service delivery is that ecosystem services can in many cases be monetized, which can help in using them for, um, for decision making. We'll, we'll apply the model as a proof of concept to Eglin Air Force Base. Um, and I hope in the process I'll be um, demonstrating or convincing you that the approach in general is robust and um, transferable. Slide 45, please. Ecosystem services, as Nate mentioned, are defined as the direct and indirect contributions of ecosystems to human well being in general. Um, because of the extensive land that military bases occupy, including oftentimes undeveloped land, um, these do provide important ecosystem services, many of which are non military ecosystem services being provided to the public. These could include um, things such as flood protection habitat provision, recreation, outdoor recreational opportunities, and carbon storage. Slide 46, please. In the course of normal base activities, in, as well as natural resource management activities specifically, um, ecosystem services may be impacted. Um, as was alluded to in the previous talk, sometimes this can be negatively in the form of creating erosion or habitat um, change, but it can also be affected positively through managed fire, forestry, erosion control activities, habitat restoration, as well as land conversion. Next slide, 47, please. So our objectives with this project have been to develop a model that can, um, in a very um, generic way, establish the monetary value of the ecosystem services that are being provided by the US military bases, as well as link the management activities that are either occurring or are being considered to changes in ecosystem service values. And we look to do this in the holistic way described um, by the schematic at the bottom of this slide, where we take base management activities, that is the specific DOD actions that are um, taking place to manage habitats and species. And we work to translate those into their biophysical effects. That is the, the changes in the specific ecosystem characteristics um, that are occurring as a result of those management activities. We then translate those into so-called benefit relevant indicators. These are the changes in the ecosystem services in units that are more directly applicable to decision making, that is to human considerations and human values. And then when possible, we put those in economic terms and monetary values of the ecosystem services that are being provided. Next slide, 48, please. So I'll walk through each of these links one at a time. Um, to link the management actions to their actual biophysical effects, we developed a series of ecological simulation models. These started as ecosystem, conceptual ecosystem models, that is representations in a conceptual way of how the variables are, are being impacted, that is the components of the system that are being impacted by the management, um, translate through to ecosystem characteristics through intermediate components, that is intermediate variables in the model. I'm showing on the right a state transition model for ecosystem transitions um, that could be used, for example, for pine forests. This was one of the many models that we included in our um, broad integrative approach. I realize you can't see the details here. I'm just showing this as a schematic of one type of ecosystem model to give a sense of um, the, the scale and level of um, connections that um, we're representing. Next slide, please, 49. At the next stage then, we take these biophysical effects, these biophysical measurable variables of ecosystem um, uh, uh, processes and states, and translate these into what we call benefit relevant indicators. These aren't yet monetary, but these are things that are more meaningful in a, in a um, human services context. So for example, a biophysical variable might be the water storage capacity of um, per unit area of a particular ecosystem. And we want to translate that into what we're actually interested in um, from an anthropocentric viewpoint, 
which is the reduction in flood risk that that water storage capacity would um, impact. And so we do this using a variety of available models, for example, flood risk models, such as the HEC models, um, smoke exposure models like CMAC, storm surge models, such as slosh, um, and through data, novel data analysis, um, using, taking advantage of the data that have been collected on, on the basis that we studied. Next slide, please, 50. Then we take these benefit relevant indicators and when possible, translate them into monetary values. Again, the goal is to put these on a common units um, such that they could be more directly comparable to other activities and costs and benefits that are taking place on the base and considerations by managers. Some of the methods that we've applied include direct market values for, um, uh, for resources such as timber, avoided costs such as when we are able to avoid flood damages, Willingness to pay, um, these are surveys oftentimes of the public of their willingness to pay for, for example, recreation or the existence of endangered species. Um, sometimes they're model-based um, estimates such as the so-called social cost of carbon. This would be the damages incurred by carbon release or lack of carbon uptake um, to society at large, um, largely through climate change. Or so-called benefits transfer. This would be benefits that have been estimated in other areas that then we transfer through appropriate modification to the sites of interest. Next slide, 51. A key aspect of our project here was the model integration that is connecting all these components which may not necessarily at first glance appear to be connected but that we know to be because of the complexity of ecosystems to account for the, these characteristic processes of ecosystems, which include things such as cumulative effects, co-benefits, uh, feedbacks, uh, synergies, um, interferences, and so forth. And so this, to emphasize this integration, we call our model, model-based tracking and integrated valuation of ecosystem services, motives. Again, the idea behind the acronym is that these provide a motive for um, decision-making that accounts for ecosystem service values. Next slide, please, 52. So I wanna talk about why this integration is important. I talked about it conceptually on the last slide as being able to address co-benefits, synergies, and so forth. But one of the key elements of our model building is accounting for the uncertainty um, because oftentimes we're both forecasting into the future and translating results and data from other sites to the sites of interest, there is uncertainty, um, much of which is uh, irreducible um, at least without gathering um, significant more information. So we put significant effort um, into and thought into representing those uncertainties in an appropriate and realistic way so that they can help inform management. So this schematic simply shows from left to right how a management decision through intermediate variables um, would lead to an estimate of economic values on the right and showing schematic histograms representing that uncertainty. One of the points I want to make with this particular diagram is because there are splits and convergences in the conceptual model as to how variables might influence one another, depending upon the underlying um, correlations driven by the underlying eco ecological processes, for example, sometimes uncertainties in one system component can reinforce or synergize with, amplify uncertainties in another component. Sometimes they can offset uncertainties and there's other components. And so tracking these is quite important because um, if you wouldn't, you'd have a um, misrepresentation of your final uncertainty, perhaps giving you an um, uh, erroneous uh, view of how conservative or liberal you can be with respect to, or proactive, I should, conservative or proactive, I should say, you can be with respect to management, how careful you need to be in terms of taking appropriate safety measures to make sure that you're robust with respect to um, ecosystem service protection. And so uncertainty provision is an important element of this, and I'd be happy to take questions on this should there be any um, as time allows. Next slide, please, 53. So we applied our approach um, and then the specific models to Eglin Air Force Base as a proof of concept. Um, Eglin Air Force Base in Florida um, along the Gulf Coast is the largest forested military base in the U.S. and it has the largest remaining mature longleaf pine forest in the world. This provides habitat for our number 24 listed in threatened or endangered species. Um, inland it also provides extensive freshwater um, the wetlands as well as estuarine wetlands along the coast, ponds and riparian meadows, 
Um, and this base as a whole supports a variety of outdoor recreational opportunities, including hunting and fishing. Next slide, please, 54. The coastal areas of Eglin Air Force Base also support at-risk fish species and um, in the process support desirable fishing spots. Um, this includes much of Santa Rosa Island, which is an important Gulf of Mexico barrier island, providing habitat for turtles, endangered shorebirds, and also thre threatened lichen. Um, the, these um, barrier islands also protect neighboring communities from storm surges and coastal flooding. And so uh, we chose this base because of this diversity of ecosystem services being provided both to the military and to surrounding communities. Slide 55, please. So as we looked at Eglin Air Force Base, um, in order to assess ecosystem services, we decided to investigate three scenarios. One being a kind of status quo or current management scenario. That is looking at the base as it's currently being managed, um, which in this case with regard to natural resources involves primarily prescribed burning to create conditions that are ultimately favorable to longleaf pine and the wildlife species that then depend upon that habitat. Then to evaluate the value of the, those management actions, we looked at a so-called no management scenario that is continuing the current military operations, um, but not um, continuing the current or historical management of natural resources. And then to look at the total value being provided by the base as a whole, we looked at a so-called counterfactual or hypothetical scenario, imagining that the base never existed in the first place. Next slide, please. This no base scenario was a novel aspect of our study. Um, what we needed to do was replace the current base footprint with the land use patterns that might have occurred had that base never been there in the first place. To do this, we used a novel um, so-called Bayesian machine learning algorithm. Essentially, it's a learning algorithm that samples from adjacent land uses in a logically coherent way and then imposes those um, patterns of adjacent land uses um, onto the footprint of the base itself. And so I'll ask Willa to um, go through the next set of slides um, about a second or so each. And these are different iterations, simulations of land uses um, that are coming from our algorithm. And we can generate a large number of these and look at the variability over what could have happened, this counterfactual scenario, should the base not have existed. And this allows us, as I mentioned earlier, to look at the uncertainty associated with some of our assumptions. As, as this has been happening, you've been seeing a variety of different footprints that have occurred of different um, land cover types. And again, these are all hypothetical for this area of the base. And the, each of these has different impacts on, on corresponding ecosystem service delivery. Great, next slide please, 64. So here are the results, again, for Eglin Air Force Base. Starting with the biophysical effects, not yet getting to the benefit relevant indicators or monetary values. What we see when we compare these three scenarios is that without the active management that has been taking place, the longleaf pine condition would degrade um, from the perspective of ecosystem service provision from a so-called open condition, which is desirable, to a so-called closed or undesirable forest condition. Those are what are labeled here. And the early, mid, and late simply refers to the um, stage in the succession of that forest. And so given that the open conditions are desirable, we have, you can see from the plots, we have a greater area of open forest conditions in the current management relative to the no management and relative to the no base scenario, which because of the assumption of commercial private logging um, would remain largely in the mid successional stage of closed forests. And this is, I should mention, for the average of the five-year period from 2031 to 2035, so projections into the future. Next slide, please, 65. Here we're looking at a habitat um, provision. So this is the area provided by um, the, the combination of land uses across the base for some key species. Um, these are on different scales um, because of the, the type of habitat and the extent of habitat. So you should note that, that we have three different scales here on the right. Um, at the, the top is importantly the red cockaded woodpecker um, for which a lot of habitat would be being provided, especially under the current management scenario. It's being managed in part in order to protect habitat for the red cockaded woodpecker, woodpecker and so that's important. Um, you can see for other species as well that in general, there's more habitat being provided for these species um, be under the current management scenario than under no management or under the no base scenario. 
There's a few exceptions, um, notably the um, Gulf Coast red flower pitcher plant and the small flowered meadow beauty. Um, in part, this is related to um, the hydraulics that are likely to occur under the different forest conditions and what these particular species prefer with respect to wet soils. Next slide, 66. When we translate this now from these benefit relevant indicators to monetary values and we aggregate over the range of ecosystem services that were being considered, what we see is, is that the current management provides $76 million per year in ecosystem services more than the no management scenario. You can see from the bar plot here, the annualized net present value from um, looking at this ecosystem services being provided in the years 2020 through 2035 are slightly over $100 million per year for the current management scenario made up of habitat of the cockaded woodpecker. Um, this ecosystem services provided for hunting, fishing, and carbon um, storage primarily. Now, if the management wouldn't have occurred, that red cockaded woodpecker habitat would diminish in the corresponding ecosystem service valuation, and there would be less land and um, uh, um, availability of, um, uh, of recreational areas, um, particularly hunting and fishing. Um, under the no base scenario, some of these lost services would be made up for by the increase in timber revenue. Um, and so in general, the current management provides more services, $76 million more than the no management scenario and 58 million more per year than the no base scenario uh, and an annualized um, discounted um, uh, monetary value. Next slide, please, 66. Um, another aspect of monetary value is the avoided flood damages. Here, um, we needed to look at it not in an absolute sense, but in a relative sense. So what we did was we took the no base scenario as the base case, and then we looked at the avoided damages um, that um, the flood damages that were avoided due to having the base, um, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, yeah, and do, uh, avoided due to having the base present at all, um, and then the additional avoided damages due to having, or, or lost avoided damages due to having the management. What we see is, is that relative to the no base scenario, the manage, current management practices avoid flood damages of about $26 million. Um, this is $30 million per year less in avoided damages than the no management scenario. Um, so we see more flood damages avoided um, in the no management scenario because of the increased water uptake largely through um, a more closed forest canopy and the associated um, biomass changes. However, this difference is more than outweighed by the enhancement of other ecosystem services being provided by management. Next slide, 68. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've managed to convince you that um, it's important to look at holistically um, and rigorously uncertainty, um, that when we do that, we can have a more precise and accurate accounting of monetary values, and in particular, in the differences between different scenarios. This allows for a robust quantification of the differences in these in a way that wouldn't be considered if each ecosystem service was being treated independently. Um, I also wanted to explain um, or give you an example of this novel Bayesian machine learning algorithm um, to give us the opportunity to simulate land use if the base were never installed. So this gives us a, a, the chance to assess the total value being provided by the base um, had it never, or being provided by the base relative to if it hadn't been present in the first place, which could be an important question for looking at the value of bases to surrounding communities and, and to um, uh, the national good at large. Um, right now, the current management at Eglin Air Force Base provides um, an average of sev about $76 million per year in ecosystem services relative to no management. Um, and what the next steps are we want to um, test the model um, conceptually and specifically by applying it to a broader variety of bases um, in order to ensure its generalizability. Next slide, please. 69. So as a whole, um, our goal with this project has been to enhance the DOD's ability to A, document the value that military bases provide to local communities in the form of ecosystem services, and then B, to predict the impact of both current and future land use and land management activities on ecosystem service production. I should say continued current activities or changed future activities. Um, and this would be then a, um, provide a management tool for land managers to decide among alternatives. Next slide, please. 
Of course, this was the work of a large project team, um, Jimmy Kagan at Oregon State University, again, a shout out to Oregon State, um, was initially the um, PI on this um, limited scope project. Also a colleague, Lydia Olander at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke. Um, Andrew Plotinga at the Brand School of Environmental Science and Management. Again, were um, other key, key uh, PIs. And then um, Megan, Ryan, Sarah, Celine um, were students, or postdocs, or research assistants um, who, of course, played a critical role in, um, in the work involved in this project. So I thank them for all of their efforts. Next slide, please. I also want to acknowledge our partners on this from the various bases and um, other sources of information and data um, that are listed here on this slide. Again, thank you for your attention. And if there are some questions, I'd be happy to address them. I apologize for the initial um, technical difficulties. Thanks for advancing the slides. That was helpful. No worries, Nate. Uh, issues do come up. All right, we've received a number of questions for you. The first one is from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Do you allow for wildfire in the no management scenario that you discussed? Yes, um, that's a great question. We do. Um, that would be the basis for being able to make a fair comparison. So we do allow for fire as a stochastic element. And in part, that's why we're looking at averages over longer time periods rather than any particular point in time. Um, the occurrence or lack thereof of a wildfire is an important stochastic element. Again, another reason to make sure we account for uncertainty and variability. Thanks for the question. Great, thank you, Mark. Here's another uh, question for you. Um, you mentioned that by tracking uncertainty holistically through the model, you can achieve greater accuracy and, pre and precision. Why is that? And can you provide an example of this phenomenon? Sure. If you don't mind going back to slide, uh, let's see, that would be slide uh, 52, please. That'll allow me to answer it in the context of that particular slide. Um, but really what it comes down to is the nature of the relations underlying the underlying relations, ecological processes among components. Um, sometimes uh, variability or uncertainty in one component can um, reinforce or amplify uncertainty in another. Sometimes it can offset or counteract it, as I mentioned. Um, and so technically, this comes down to whether the joint distribution of that represents the uncertainty in these is positively or negatively correlated, has a positive or negative covariance. So for example, in this slide, if it turns out that because of natural variability or uncertainty, the forest density in, towards the bottom left um, turns out to be higher than we might anticipate in the model, then what we would anticipate that density would then lead to um, a higher forest canopy um, and um, less evapotranspiration and the promotion of ecosystem services that are supported by wet soils, um, some particular species, for example. Um, and that might have an uh, undue or unanticipated increase in the value being provided by those particular species. Of course, um, that means that at the same time, the dry species are less well supported um, and the other dry, dry ecosystem services at the top of the plot. And so then those would shift in a downward direction. So each of those would be shifted um, relative to what we might have anticipated or be on the corresponding high or low end of the distributions. And if we just looked at those, um, it wouldn't be until we sum them as economic values that we would realize those ecosystem services, the departures, the deltas relative to what we anticipated, at least partially offset one another. And so that then the overall precision, that is the, um, the width of or the tightness of the underlying distribution and economic values may still be tight, again, if they always offset one another. And we may not have as much uncertainty as would be, um, as would be implied by the uncertainty in those individual components. And so in that particular example, they offset one another and the uncertainty in the, um, is narrower than we might otherwise anticipate. Some cases, they might amplify one another and then we have a higher uncertainty. Um, if some uncertainties propagate through the system, for example, if it is unusually warm, for example, then we might not only have um, a drier ecosystem, but we might have more forest fires and we would want to anticipate that. 
And so that's why we look at the variety of scenario, a large number of scenarios through the model and account for these interrelations. Good question, thanks. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, is Motive a freely um, available tool for assessing <laughs> EXs? And if not, will it be in the future? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, it's not, it's currently a research tool. Um, it really was developed with an eye towards applying it to Eglin Air Force Base. Um, with continued um, work in the future, we hope to be able to first demonstrate its generalizability um, and add or modify any components that would support that generalizability and then release a more user-friendly version. I think one of the advantages um, of being able to develop a model that's uh, focused on military bases is, is that there is a certain uniformity in the data collection across these bases, making it easier than it might otherwise be to develop a generalizable and user-friendly model. Um, and so we're optimistic about our ability to do that, although it may still be a few years off. Great, thank you. And here's a question from EPA. Um, in the uh, Bayesian no base case, how many iterations did you create and how did you average them? So in theory, we could create as, as many as we wanted. Um, for the pilot, we just created 10. Um, that probably isn't enough to get the full scope, but we wanted these to be um, clearly recognizable as feasible um, land use patterns. Um, and we wanted to be able to look at them and explore them. Um, and, and, and to be honest, there was some computational demand that we weren't able to meet in this limited scope study. Um, we didn't average them, and I think that's a key point here, is every iteration was tracked all the way through the model. And so um, when I showed schematically those histograms, um, then um, each iteration um, would lead to one you know, a component, one piece data point in those histograms, and we could look across the histograms to look at the variability. So rather than average the land use or land cover patterns, what we did was preserve individual land cover and land use patterns through the model, um, and then at the end, represented the range as a distribution. And in some of my plots, I suppose I did show the mean, but that would be the mean of the endpoint um, with error bars representing, I believe the 90% credible intervals um, of the distribution on that particular variable. So it's a good, it's a good question. And again, it was important like, you, you know, our, our um, concept all along was to make sure we're appropriately addressing correlations and the uncertainties. And that was an important element of this Bayesian machine learning algorithm, that we wanted spatially coherent land use patterns, not just kind of scattershot random land use over that according to the background frequency, but actually um, the coherence in terms of spatial adjacency. That was an important element there because that really does influence um, habitat, for example, um, runoff patterns and, and other um, land, use pro land um, scale processes. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, here's a question from the U.S. Army Environmental Command. Uh, does the variability of biophysical effect, like no management or current management, account for the impacts of natural disasters like hurricanes or global climate? And have you analyzed the impact of these variables on the long-term monetary impact on military installations and Gulf Coast economies? You're great. Um, so it sounds like there's a couple elements to that. One is the role of stochastic processes like hurricanes or stochastic events like hurricanes, wildfires, and so forth. Um, that we can and have addressed in the sense of, as I mentioned with wildfires, as stochastic events that would be a possible um, hypothetical future that would be one of many possible simulations. Um, we haven't yet done that for hurricanes. Um, in this limited scope project, we haven't had the capability to model hurricanes um, in an appropriate way for this space, but it is something we'd like to add in the future. Although, as I mentioned, um, the wildfires um, are incorporated. Uh, then there seems to be another part of that question, which is um, climate impacts. And um, as Nate mentioned in his presentation, with climate change, there may be changes both in the stochastic events and in long-term trends. Right now, we didn't incorporate any long-term trends, but we assumed it was a stable environment apart from the stochasticity so that we really could look at the differences in a, say, in management, no management scenario. Um, if we find with future work that 
trends are an important element of decision making, then um, we would seek to incorporate those next. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, this is a question from Noblis. Can you speak to another counterfactual, the situation in which the land was set aside as a preserved area? Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we certainly could. I mean, one could put in a counterfactual of, say, protecting it as uh, in, in particular land cover forms. Uh, we didn't. We wanted to kind of minimize the um, judgments the, uh, that we we wanted to impose on this, um, although that could certainly be an additional scenario. Um, we hadn't seen that as something that anybody was proposing or considering, and so we didn't see additional value added. Um, you know, as we looked at a counterfactual of the no base scenario, that was kind of what we started with. We said, would a reasonable no base scenario be just kind of pre, <laughs> um, pre-settlement uh, forest cover? And we decided that wasn't um, realistic. Uh, it would have required a historical trajectory that we just hadn't seen there. And so um, we decided to do this simulation. But there's nothing stopping us from if that turns out to be something that is of particular importance, maybe at some other locations. All right, and one final question we, before we uh, pull Nate back in. What basis do you think would be a good choice to apply uh, motives to next? So in developing the model, um, we, the, the motives model, we developed conceptual models. We didn't quantify them all, we didn't mathematicize them, but we developed conceptual models for Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, Fort, Fort Hood in Texas, and also like Nate looked at Joint Base Lewis McCord in Washington. So I think it would be straight, a straightforward progression of what we've done to next look at those particular bases. Um, and then our goal is, you know, those are, you know, sufficiently broad diversity of bases that if we can feel like we can apply the model to those, um, you know, it may require some additional manipulation or additions, um, then we could feel more comfortable releasing a model that we can um, believe is, is more broadly generalizable. And what we would do next is then test it to say another half dozen bases um, before making it user friendly um, and more broadly freely available. Great, thank you. All right, let's move on to some general questions and we'll start with you, Mark. When the end user is the DOD rather than the public, and this was alluded to earlier in, in the uh, first Q&A session, how do you distinguish the value of the land itself from the value of the ecosystem service being provided by the land? Mark? Yeah, that's an important point. It's something that we wrestled with conceptually. And I think, um, you know, to a certain degree is a difference between, I think, how Nate's team approached it and how we did. Um, the, I think it's important to distinguish the value that's added by the ecosystem relative to just the um, land value on, you know, the value of the land on which the base lies. Um, and so in order to do that, I believe you do need kind of counterfactuals. You need to either assume, for example, what the land would have looked like um, had the base not been there, or if it had been managed in, in different ways. You can't just go with a kind of current management scenario um, because you don't get that in a kind of incremental or relative sense. Um, for the time being, we bypass that largely by focusing on values of um, to the external stakeholders, that is to the public. So the values that we provided aren't the values to um, the base in terms of providing training um, conditions. They were values that are being provided to the society at large. Um, we felt that that was, um, in this case, maybe a more appropriate way to broaden the scope of how ecosystem services are, are being evaluated. But it certainly could be done, but I'd certainly caution kind of care in making sure that we don't falsely kind of double count or overestimate ecosystem services by simply taking the entire value of training um, when some of it is being provided by ecosystems and some simply by the presence of, of the land conditions themselves. Rula, this is Nate. Did you want me to expand on that? 
maybe we lost Rula. Why don't you, Nate? <laughs> well, I think you summarized it well. I think, you know, when it, realtors, for example, will put one value on the land, and that's a very different value than we would have a uh, different valuation than we would have if it was a DOD base or a forest service land or anything else. So yeah, contrasting and comparing those within a integrated system makes sense. Hi, this is Eric Sukumel stepping in for Rula while she works through her phone difficulties. Um, the next general question we have uh, for both speakers, uh, what are the next steps in simulation of ecosystem services of relevance to the DOD? Mark, would you like to go first or would you like me? Go ahead. Yeah, I took the last one first. Um, you know, in our, I'm sure Mark's opinions and mine probably jive a lot, but they will differ in the methodology, but probably be consistent in terms of what the ultimate goals are. But the next steps from a process model simulation approach, the one we used, would be to be, for example, species specific, because really, the, you know, a lot of these DOD bases are diverse in terms of their forest compositions and the endangered species, the carbon storage, et cetera, the growth rates all vary with species. And we haven't done that yet. So that's an important step. And that's a hard step. That's an example of one big step that needs to happen. But I think we could list many more uncertainties, as Mark did, that we need to constrain. Would you like to add to that, Mark? No, I think, I guess my answer to that question would be um, largely in the scope of the ecosystem services that we look at. Um, we didn't, for example, yet look at water quality improvements. Um, that might be important at some bases and that um, might require a, a, an additional model component. Um, we might look more broadly at how we value species existence. Um, we used limited scope studies that were then used a benefits transfer approach. So we looked at where um, others had done surveys and sometimes that can be um, geographically specific. Um, we also might look at a more comprehensive assessment of economic values. For some of the BRIs that we had, we weren't able to translate them into monetary value directly. Um, and it's worth exploring whether that is always necessary or whether keeping things in those BRI units, the benefit relevant indicator units are sufficient for managers. So I think when we look at relevance to DOD, I see those as some of the um, key components. I think ultimately that question gets answered by the DOD specific management needs to some extent. Is it erosion? Is it water quality? Is it species? They have their priorities and we need to bet, you know, we need to accommodate those. That's a good point. Thank you both. And this is a question from Cal EPA for both of you. And let's start with Nate. Would arid DOD installations of the Southwest uh, of the United States need a fundamental change in the underlying model structures that you described, or is just arid a variation on a theme from the modeled uh, forested system? Nate? Sure, it's a great question, because regional differences really matter. And as we learned in our pilot study, they, 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 they affect how management outcomes manifest. So it's a great question. And in the Southwest, which is where I live, uh, these, the models, the model structures fundamentally, and I bet this goes for Marx as well as ours, are, are, are transferable, right? Ecosystem models should rep represent the common processes in, in, in these functions. However, when we expand to something like integration with an economic model, there has to be adaptation, you're right, because there are different valuations and different values by the public and by the DOD in the Southwest than there are in other parts of the world. From an ecological perspective though, it's, it's, the Southwest is extremely fire prone. So for example, wildfire mitigation and management to avoid it is enormous there. And it's not such a big deal, let's say at JBLM in the Northwest. So you're right that there's gonna be these differences. So fundamentally, the models should hold tight, but there will be site-specific differences that we need to account for. Thank you. Mark, would you like to add something to uh, Nate's response? No, I, I agree with his response. Let's, I'll save the time for other questions. 
Wonderful. Uh, here's another question for both of you, and this is the last question before we wrap up. Um, can you just elaborate on the difference between avoided damages and ecosystem service benefits, and then leave us with your key thoughts on the value of ecosystem services before uh, we conclude. And let's start with you, Mark. Sure. Um, good question regarding the distinction between avoided damages and um, ecosystem service benefits. Um, I tried to mention that earlier, but to clarify, um, avoided damages are units taken w with respect to a reference case. And so they always have to, they're not absolute, they have to be with respect to something. And so it's important to distinguish what that baseline case is. Um, in our case, we took the no base scenario as being a baseline, and then we said there were avoided flood damages with respect to that. Um, ecosystem services generally are um, characterized in an absolute term, that is the total services being provided by a system. And so because of that, you can't always compare those necessarily um, on the same plots or in the same tables that they sometimes are relative to one another and sometimes are absolute. And so um, I presented them in each of those two ways. And I think sometimes it's important to distinguish. Um, and then the second part of your question was, um, remind me, please. What is the key message that you'd like to, to mm. leave our audience with on ecosystem services? Just, <laughs> just one key message. Sure. Mine is that military bases provide a lot of ecosystem services and that should be considered um, both by the public at large and by um, the way in which the bases are managed. Wonderful. And Nate, would you like to weigh in on, on both these questions, please? Sure. I, I really liked Mark's answers and so I won't re be redundant with those except for to add that, uh, you know, comparing ecosystem services to to what to the, to the status quo or what would happen if we didn't manage or if we didn't really is extremely valuable. I agree and, and essential because those different scenarios really have large outcomes. Back to the question about the Southwest, you know, a massive wildfire burning the forest down versus a managed forest makes a big difference. In terms of a key takeaway home uh, position that I would share with the audience, I, I agree with Marx that. We, it's a given, and we know this, that the DOD bases provide a lot of ecosystem services that actually aren't available on a lot of other land surfaces. Mm -hmm. These are protected landscapes, remember. You know, so, so these landscapes, to some degree, house biodiversity and forests and age structures that are fairly unique to the current landscape, and they're super valuable. And I would just add that I think we can through these various methods that we've heard about today and others, we, we can value these systems in a way that is practical and, and, and effective and useful for the management, I think. Thank you. I'd like to thank you on, on behalf of CERDUP and ESTCP for a fantastic webinar. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up with some reminders. Um, please keep in mind that a um, a recording uh, of both the audio uh, and uh, the video of today's uh, session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to it in the future, as will a PDF of the slides. We would appreciate it uh, if you can please um, call in uh, into our next webinar, uh, which is on Thursday, June 4, in the Weapons, Systems, and Platforms for Program area. Uh, this webinar will present research efforts, de research efforts designed to improve the treatment of oil and water emulsions in shipboard bilge water to help DOD increase uh, the volume of wastewater, which can then be discharged to open waters. The webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Carrie Ditcher from the uh, University of Minnesota and Ms. Danielle Painter uh, from the Naval Surface Warfare uh, Center. Uh, registration is open uh, for this webinar and for uh, all webinars through the end of 2020. So please visit the CERDUP and ESCCP webinar webpage to register. Uh, we would appreciate it at this time if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen.
This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your attention.